the shores of the Arctic Ocean. The rhythmic sound of the Selamute drummers and dancers. They sing about the stories and traditions of the Inuvialuit. This song is called Bringing Back the Sun, and it's about a community gathering after a long, dark winter. Tuktiuktuk is remote and isolated, hard to get to and hard to leave, but that's all about to change. What do you think of the road? Well, I think it's very positive for uh, for the people and for stores and uh, opening to the world, better than being isolated. My late father, he was the first one to dump a load of gravel onto the highway. So I always thought that he made history. <laughs> and that is because that's the beginning. <laughs> a new beginning is coming. And it lies beyond these gates, a $300 million road that will permanently connect Taktayaktak to the rest of Canada. For now, it's still closed to the public, but we got a chance to drive the 140-kilometer route as crews finished building it. We are expecting to open the highway November 15, 2017. For nearly four years, Dean Ahmed has been overseeing construction of the highway. It runs from Inuvik to Tuck and crosses coastal plains, teeming with lakes and streams, which are frozen for most of the year. Very few highways have been built in the Arctic Circle. And it is quite challenging, but uh, there have, have been uh, initially a learning curve where uh, all of us uh, needed to adapt and acquaint ourselves with the challenges. So in that sense, it's unique and it's quite exciting that way. This road has been somewhat of an experiment because only a few have been built in this type of environment. Dozens of temperature monitors have been installed deep underground ensure the areas that support bridges stay frozen. But it's the surface that's causing the biggest challenges. You can see how spongy the ground is. Just below the surface is permafrost. And when the top layer melts, it causes the earth to shift, making it very difficult to build on. So most of the construction was done during the winter months when the ground was completely frozen. Crews worked in shifts around the clock when frigid temperatures and little daylight were the norm. Ahmet says the traditional way of building a road where sections are cut and filled is not an option here. One of the characteristics of the, of the design of this project is that you cannot disturb the uh, tundra. So geotextile fabric was used to protect and insulate the permafrost and then loads of gravel and rocks were layered on top. It made for a bumpy ride when we were escorted up the still closed off highway. Crews hadn't yet smoothed out this section. We weren't even halfway through our trip. Yeah, that is flat. When one of our front tires decided it had had enough. It did not make it. Up to Tuck. The road won this round. We would have to make do driving on a spare for the rest of the trip. We were the only visitors on the road. As we drove, we passed trucks and heavy equipment building some of the final sections. At the peak of the construction, more than 400 people were working on the highway. We're going to start our 12 hour shift at uh, 7 p.m. And 7 a.m. we'll finish. Kevin St. a man drives a rock truck now, but used to operate a plow on the ice road. Each winter, the frozen route offered residents a way out of Tuck. It was the only alternative to taking a flight to Inuvik, which can cost hundreds of dollars each way. But now, a year-round, all-season road has St. Amand mulling um, a new career path. Be, I want to open a restaurant okay. somewhere, halfway you know, from Tuck to Inuvik, there's a halfway point. And, you know, there's going to be 
people that are wanting to stop all over the place, so I have some french fries halfway there. <laughs> Perhaps it's still more of a dream than a legitimate business plan, but it is part of a larger conversation taking place here. Once the road is built and the construction jobs are gone, what's next? Because the reality of the road now is much different than when it was first proposed. The last step in completing the dream of McDonald and Diefenbaker, the dream to see all Canadians linked from coast to coast to coast. When the federal government committed to funding two-thirds of the highway in 2013, Stephen Harper was prime minister. The focus then was on Arctic sovereignty and resources. Today in Tuck, boarded up work camps and rusting equipment are remnants of a busier time when companies explored offshore for oil and gas. Many hoped the new highway would revive a stalled industry, but that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. Low energy prices mean companies aren't investing in the Arctic, and last year the Liberal government put in place a moratorium on new offshore drilling in the region. So every now and then I get a whack of these, who are they, you know? All of it, Nellie Cornier says, is forcing Tuck to change and adapt. She served as the premier of the Northwest Territories in the 1990s and was a longtime chair of the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation, which focuses on improving life and creating new economic opportunities for those who live here. People are still here. People want to work. People need jobs. In Tuck, the unemployment rate is 30 percent, with the highway unlikely to be a road to resources. The hope now is that it can bring in more tourists. I have no doubt in my mind we're going to survive and we're going to adapt. We did it before and we're going to do it now. We're going to try our very, very best to show Tupiatok as one of a destination point. Each week during the summer, a few dozen adventurous tourists make the trek up here by boat and plane. How was the boat ride? Wonderful. Have a great time. Most normally stay for a few hours. Time to take a few photos and dip their toes <laughs> in the Arctic Ocean. It's me. <laughs> It's cold, but it's awesome. It's like 15 degrees. Yeah. Kylik Kisun Taylor runs day tours three days a week from Inuvik. He markets his trips as a journey into the inaccessible, but the new road will change that. There's going to be a lot more traffic coming to Tuck, a hundred times more than there is right now because of, it's just the tank of gas to come up. The question now is just what is there to do once people get here? There are few places to stay, no restaurants to eat at, and very little infrastructure to lure tourists. I'm hoping that some people will be organized enough to have something here for people so when they come it's not just to dip their toe and then turn around and go back. You want people to stay for at least a day or two overnight, stay, you know, eat your food, shop at your stores, you know, so um, hopefully that will, that will happen. For now, the community is looking at creating a campground. New benches have been set up along the shore, and the hamlet is getting spruced up. Cans of paint were donated, and local workers like Stanley Felix have been hired to paint homes. I never thought I'd be working for community beautification or anything like that before. I, I painted houses when I was younger, but not, not like this. So far, they've painted 14 buildings. Felix hopes the bright colors give homeowners a bit of a lift. As for the road, his feelings are mixed. Concerned, but at the same time excited. You know, so it'd be uh, a good opportunity for a lot of our people in the community to look at different avenues, uh, like maybe tourism. And so what are your concerns about it? Oh, hard drugs. You know, that scares me. I know there's going to be a bit more alcohol, and that's a concern. I guess you're just worried that it'll be easier to bring that stuff in now. Yeah, it'll be a lot easier. Like any other community that uh, never had a road and then got a road and then everything changed. I'm worried about our, uh, our people losing our cultural base, you know, our footing, uh, where we come from and how we got here. But for all of the trepidation about what the new road could open Tuck up to, 
There is excitement, a lot of it. People are hoping the highway will bring down the high food prices in the grocery store. And if it doesn't, it will at least make it easier for people to be able to stock up elsewhere. But it's this group that will experience the biggest change. Edward, could you push me high? Nearly 30% of the population here is under the age of 15, and they will grow up in a community that will soon be less isolated. Joe Nazagalowak sees that as the greatest benefit, because he knows what it's like to feel as if you're cut off from the rest of the world. What do you hope that the road brings for Tuck? Freedom. <laughs> Today, he's a renowned carver, but when he was a teenager, he went to Toronto for a two-week student exchange. The experience altered how he saw his community. When I came back, I was, I felt really isolated. I felt I'd never get out of this town or, you know, at that time, you know, you grew up with no money. You know, you're just making a living, you know, surviving. And to myself, I thought that, you know, we're so isolated, I think. In many ways, life is very different now. Long gone are the days with no running water or flush toilets. No Today, he and his family live comfortably in a home where there's always plenty of music and time for tea. Try that song for tonight. As a father, Nazagalowak wants his children to thrive, and he's eager for them to be able to experience the outside world much more than he did while growing up. To me, I think that the greatest thing that happened in Tuck, in my lifetime, the young people will grow up feeling more with confidence. It'll take generations, but you will see that they will grow up feeling like we're tied in the other world. My kids are excited, they make them excited so they could know that it's, it's not a danger. We've got to accept it with the open arms and say we have a road and we'd be happy about it. Because regardless of what this road does or does not bring to Tuktayaktuk, it will change life for the 900 people who live here connecting the community and the Arctic coast to the rest of the country in a way it's never been before. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Tuktayaktuk.